We will now look at the almighty issue of customer experience and how to manage difficult customers. We will look at how to manage customer participation in the production of services. We will look at the role customers play in the service delivery process. You will understand what customer experience is, why it matters. We will look at principles of great customer experiences. Then we will look at how to manage difficult customers. We will look at types of difficult customers. And then we'll also try to understand service recovery and steps in handling dissatisfied customers. So fasten your seatbelts and get ready because we're going to go on a jolly good ride. Let's start by looking at customer participation. Now, one thing we need to take cognizance of is that all good service is co-produced. What that means is that the service provider has a role, the customer has a role. When these two parties play their role satisfactorily, then we have a good service outcome. So customer participation refers to the role that customers play during a service encounter. So a typical example would be a patient seeking medical treatment for a physician. Before you go and do certain types of medical tests, you'll be mandated to abstain from food for a while, and so on and so forth. If you play your role well, the doctor is also uniquely positioned to give the best advice so you can stay healthy and live a long, fruitful life. There are three types of customer participation we need to take cognizance of as we move towards the delivery of excellent service. We have what we call high-level participation, moderate or middle-level participation, and then we have low-level participation. Now, in high-level participation, the customer creates the service product. The service cannot be provided without the customers participating. So for instance, if you want to move from 92 kilos to 72 kilos within six months, and you go and patronize gymnasium services, you have to actively go there four to six times a week at a certain time, do a certain prescribed number of exercises, follow a particular regime. So in order to lose weight, the patronage of gym services represents for the customer what we can categorize as high level participation because the customer actively creates the service product. Without the customer, there can be no uh, 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 reg regime to follow, regimen to follow, and the, and the service provider has nobody to take care of. In moderate level customer participation, this is, for instance, a client who wants an accountant to prepare a tax return for them. If you want this service performed, you, the customer, must run out to the accountant information and fiscal documents that the accountant can use to prepare the returns correctly. And then you should be prepared to respond to any queries the accountant may have. So this level of participation is not as intense as the weight loss one I described earlier, where you have high participation of the customer. Then you have what we call low participation. Here, the services tend to be pretty standardized and they are provided regardless of any individual purchase. So um, sometimes for the customer, payment for the product or service may be the only input and specification or requirement you are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are supposed to undertake. And the service employees and service systems typically do all the work. So for instance, when it comes to uh, the payment of, for instance, electricity or for a digital mobile provider or digital TV services. You typically just have to arrange for some direct debit from a bank account and that's all you need to do to get the thing working. You don't need to worry about whether or not the provider will come through because you assume they will come through. So once 
your account is being debited. That's one the input you need to make to ensure you are enjoying the digital uh, TV services or maybe the mobile services. And that's it. So that's low participation. Now, customers perform certain types of rules when it comes to service delivery. And they can either be a productive resource or they can be a contributor to quality or satisfaction. Now, when customers are seen as a productive resource, they could actually be considered as partial employees of the firm. So let's take, for instance, a case of a bank who uses credit cards or ATM machines. Once you are using these sorts of automated or electronic services, you cut down the pressure on the bank to employ human resources in order to deliver you services in relation to cash withdrawals on the banking shop floor. So when you work as a productive resource to a service firm, you have to cut down the labor bill of that firm. Now, when you work as a customer, as a contributor to quality and satisfaction, you get to the point where, for instance, in a no-frills airline service, you buy food yourself. Sometimes you seat yourself because it's free seating. Or in a restaurant buffet service, you serve your own food. Now, the contributions you make during the service encounter sometimes determines the quality of service and the level of satisfaction you receive. So there are certain situations where the customer's contribution is also an indicator of the overall quality of satisfaction that emanates at the end of the service delivery. Whether customer participation is low, moderate, or high, it must still be managed. And this is because customer, customer input can affect a service service productivity through both the quality of what they contribute and the resulting quality and quantity of output generated. So if customer participation is not managed carefully, it may sometimes result in poor service delivery and unsatisfactory service performances. I remember about 14, 15 years ago, I went to get a certain type of card. So today, I'm not too sure that was debit or credit. But I remember I used the card once, twice, and the card got missing. When I went back to the bank to demand that the money I loaded on the card be paid to me, I was told that because I had lost that plastic card, the money too had gone, and therefore the bank couldn't refund my money. Needless to say, I was very, very livid, because I didn't understand why loading money onto a card meant that if the card got missing, the money was also missing. It made no sense whatsoever. It took the bank 11 years of constant complaining, bad mouthing them, for an employer of the bank to finally arrange for the money to be refunded to me. 11 years. That was one clear instance where Casper participation by that bank was extremely poorly managed. And when that happens, you get poor service or unsatisfactory service experiences. Now, customers and employees have to fully play the assigned roles in service delivery for satisfactory service outcomes to be achieved. And so if that happens, we have positive customer experiences. Now, customer experience can be defined as the internal and subjective response customers have when they make any contact, direct or indirect, with a service company. Now, customer experience is not restricted to the usage of a product or service. It spans every interaction, every customer time point interaction that a customer has with a business or its offerings. So the aim of customer experience is the optimization of customer interactions with an organization throughout the entire life cycle of that customer. 
So good experiences can change the entire perception a customer holds towards a particular service organization. So there are some constituents of customer experience. And one of those constituents is customer support. What a business provides throughout the customer life cycle to ensure a customer's success with a product or service is characterized as customer support. Customer service is also a part of customer experience. And it means that a service entity proactively goes above and beyond the call of duty to provide answers, help, or guidance to the customer of that particular service organization. Why does customer experience matter so, so, so much? Well, because for, 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 for a start, it helps to improve customer satisfaction and delight. It helps to push customer loyalty. It helps to increase customer advocacy and referrals. Now, customer satisfaction is one of the byproducts of enhanced customer experience. McKinsey, in 2014, found that companies focusing on maximizing customer satisfaction with regard to the entire customer journey have the potential to increase satisfaction by 20% and profitability as a result. With customer loyalty, what we seek to do as a service entity is to create an experience that truly impresses customers and exceeds their expectations and ensures that they want to continue doing business with us short, medium to long term. And you see, excellent customer experience is all said is an important differentiator when it comes to achieving competitor difference. Advocacy and referrals. Now, when the expectations a service firm sets for a customer experience are exceeded, that interaction creates a memorable experience that customers will remember and they'll continue sharing with everybody they come across, thereby increasing the likelihood that those they speak to will also come and do business with your service entity. Now, customer experience also matters because it can help to reduce customer churn. Nowadays, I don't argue too much with service entities that don't meet my expectations. I just vote with my feet, close the business, move along my life, because I think there are so many viable options nowadays that price is not the main reason why I would leave. And price is often also not the main reason for customer chair. Usually, bad human interaction, poor service knowledge are some of the most potent reasons why people think I've had enough and I'm going. So poor quality of customer service is actually one of the main reasons for customer chain and customer attrition in terms of the human contact. So focusing on customer experience will help eliminate areas in the service business where you have the highest potential to experience customer churn. Oh, and one of the most obvious reasons why we need superior customer experience is that when customer experience is good, it's delightful, customers who value good service are prepared to pay a premium for the excellent service. So not only do you as a service firm keep your good clients, but they keep paying you good money to keep you profitable and to enable you to keep generating the resources you need to further improve those customer experiences. Excellent service is also becoming the only strategic difference across several industries. So with truly memorable customer experience, firms can achieve a competitive difference that will make them the preferred choice over and over again in relation to their closest and indirect competitors. So let look at, let's look at a few customer experience statistics. Now, a customer is four times more likely to defect to a competitor if their problem is service related rather than product or price related. And the probability of selling to an existing customer is 60 to 70%, whereas the probability of sell, successful selling to a new prospect is 15 to 
So if you have current clients whose expectations you keep exceeding, whose customer experiences are positive, you have far more opportunity to sell to them than going to prospect for new ones. Additionally, for every customer complaint, there are probably 26 other unhappy customers who have just kept mute, haven't said anything. And a 2% increase in customer retention has the same effect as decreasing cost by 10%. 96% of unhappy customers do not complain. However, 91% of these will simply leave and never come back. A dissatisfied customer would tell between 9 to 15 people about their experience. And around 13% of dissatisfied customers tell more than 20 people about how badly they've been treated. 70% of buying experiences are based on how the customer feels about their prior experiences with that product or service. 55% of customers will pay extra to guarantee a better service. And it takes 12 positive experiences to make up for one unresolved negative experience. A 5% reduction in customer defection rates can increase profits by 5 to 9%. Now these are statistics that have been generated from different types of empirical research done over the years from both professional service firms and academics. One scholar in 2015 in publishing a paper sought to advance certain principles of great customer experiences and I want to share this with you in giving you some food for thought in how to go back to your workplace, back to your offices, back to your teams and give them some excellent input on how to start improving customer experiences from today. One, understand your customer. I can't stress how much so many customers are misunderstood on the continent of Africa and in other frontier markets. Sometimes there's an assumption that once you are there, we know what you want. Without a real commitment to the kind of research that gives you valuable customer insights to keep delighting them over and over and over again. So one, understand your customer. Two, know that first impressions are real and lasting. In module one, I discussed the concept of moments of truth. 10 to 15 second opportunities to make a first time positive and lasting impression in any service encounter. In module three, I'm saying again, that the second principle of delivering great customer experiences is knowing that first impressions are real and lasting. Three, do what you say you are going to do. This whole attitude of neglecting deadlines, getting back to customers whenever you want, is something that must quickly be frowned on and quickly gotten rid of as we push forward to deliver excellent customer experiences. Number four, under promise and over deliver. Number five, listen, 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 listen to your customer. I read an article that said that 20 to 40% of all customer service challenges are due to poor listening skills. So we don't listen well enough in order to be able to provide an astute diagnosis of the customer problem, and therefore advance the proper solution to those problems. Listen, listen, listen. Whether it's face-to-face -face or electronic, listen, listen well. So that's point number six, listen, listen. Sorry, that's number five, listen. Number six, follow up with your customer. Number seven, know that you are subjectively communicating with your customer every moment of every day. Next principle, let your customers know you truly appreciate that business. You see, this mindset that if they are there and we are here, they know we care. It's something we should get rid of. Take time out to say thank you. Send them real appreciation. Contact them even when it doesn't relate to the business you are providing to them. I, I fight with certain companies because... The only time I hear from them is when they are billing me 
or where they are telling me that they've taken some money from my account. And I keep asking them that, listen, if the only time I hear from you is when you are taking something from me, how do I go to sleep at night knowing that you have my best interest at heart? Because it looks like the only thing you're interested in is taking my money. That can't be very good. Next principle, the little things matter. What that basically means is that be excessively detail-oriented. Make sure you cross all your T's and dot all your I's. Then let, you know, sometimes I meet some managers, some CEOs, some people who keep saying, oh, but if we didn't do it well, at least we've tried. We can do better later. I'm like, really? Some of the mistakes can cause so much customer unhappiness. You cannot console yourself with the fact that, oh, next time we'll do it better. The thinking should be that we must strive to always do it right the first time. But the last principle, what flows from what I'm saying is that if something negative happens, strive to make it right to ensure it doesn't recur.